Welcome to another edition of Panel Planner 101 Live, part of the Avionics Boot Camp feature at Aviation Consumer Magazine. In today's episode, we're going to look at a flagship Garmin Avionics retrofit for a Cessna T210 Centurion. We'll talk about the planning process and what it takes to actually get the job done. We're on board this turbocharged Cessna Centurion. It's an M model T210 with uh, Scott Dyer. And Scott, you know, I've been watching this airplane get upgraded incrementally over a lot of years and uh, you've owned this airplane for how many years now? Oh gosh, I, I can't do the math but I bought it in 97 after the first 210 I had that I bought in 95 was a horror story and uh, so I got out of that one and I owned a fleet for all, about six or nine months and this airplane became available so I grabbed it. It's even more of a keeper because you've done a lot of upgrades to it. Yeah. A lot of improvements. TKS uh, anti-ice system, a custom interior, nice paint, lots of engine work along the way. Yep. And now a flagship, a Garmin retrofit. Yeah. And, you know, the airplane started out as, uh, you know, a, a mostly king-equipped airplane with, the, I think it was the KLN 90 uh, GPS at the time. It had all round and analog dials, uh, probably 12, 15 years ago, we upgraded to, I upgraded to the uh, Garmin 530, which was the first uh, big GPS upgrade in the machine, but I still kept all the round dials. And uh, that was the case really up until did this upgrade me. And when I say we, I mean me and the shop because it was a joint effort uh, earlier this year in 2023. And uh, we went to pretty much all glass. What was the, what was the motivation to, uh, to take an airplane that was already pretty well equipped, a good IFR navigator, had traffic, had ADSB, weather avoidance, but what brought you to this flagship Garmin upgrade? Yeah, well, you know, I'm fortunate that with the family, we've done trips out west, we've done the southwest, we've done the northwest, we've gone to uh, Newfoundland, we've done the Bahamas, we've traveled all around with analog gauges. And uh, the airplane clearly can do a lot. I was fortunate to have an STEC 55X that was put in here probably close to 20 years ago now uh, with altitude pre-select and everything which which really worked fairly well. Uh, the STEC autopilot was not quite as good as the old analog Cessna IFCS 400B that was in here originally which flew the airplane like butter. It was just wonderful. The STEC was a little bit more ham-handed but it got the job done. I had been teaching in G1000 aircraft. I've been teaching people with uh, you know various forms of other upgrades to glass. I was thinking you know here I am in the second half of my 70th decade. So I'm 67. I hope to be flying for another seven or eight years, maybe longer. Uh, and I also want to have a nice resaleable airplane if and when I have to get out. And that may be a while more. And so I thought there were a couple of things that drove me, Larry, one of which was I want to enjoy the flying and I want to enjoy the benefits of glass panel and electronic instrumentation while I still have a good flying career and I'm just back from the west coast now uh, in this airplane and it was awesome. The second thing is it gives me a better resale value later which I hope people who when it comes time for me to part with this airplane would recognize because of the um, very careful attention to detail in terms of cleaning the interior of any corrosion when the uh, interior work was done uh, and, and just keeping it up very nicely along the way and, it, and attending to details. And I was very comfortable with the basic Garmin operating logic at that point. And so I liked that very much. Avidyne really wasn't that much in the picture when I was looking at this and I certainly had no experience with their displays except for a few hours in a legacy Cirrus that had Avidyne equipment. Um, there were, you know, a few other 
you know, possible upgrade paths, but I really liked the Garmin. I was comfortable with that, and I went with it. And so initially, I was very much interested in the uh, G3X as as the primary flight display uh, for for this airplane. And what I found in talking with my shop was that you know these, while it's a 1978 T210M, they're not all the same and they're somewhat bespoke in the way that they are created on the assembly line. And that G3X what just wasn't going to fit without designated uh, engineering representative work in my panel for a 10-inch PFD. Uh, and so what that suggested was that I would be much better off with the G500 TXI, uh, which is you know, only a few years old on the market, and it is a dynamite system and in fact I think it's a whole lot better than the G1000 that I had been flying with and so I decided to go with the G500 TXI uh, as the PFD and that drove some other decisions as well uh, such as the engine instrumentation system which I put on a 7 inch uh, G500 TXI, and which I've been very happy with. We can talk about that a little bit more. And then the Garmin Autopilot, you know, one upgrade path that I had was the Genesis uh, Autopilot that would have been an upgrade for the S Tech 55X. And I had had enough um, difficulty with the uh, 55X uh, where it would hunt a bit. It would hunt both laterally, it would hunt in altitude, it would overturn and then correct when I'm turning to a heading or a course. Um, and it was fine, it was serviceable, but it wasn't great. Everything I heard about the GFC 500, just like the 600, is that it was an awesome autopilot that flew the airplane really like, and in fact better than I had been accustomed to with the original equipment, the IFCS uh, 400B that this came out of the factory with. Uh, and so that's why I went with that. A little trepidation because of servo issues with Garmin, and I'm happy to see that actually they have really stepped up to the plate. I have not had any of those issues because mine was installed really after they fixed the servos. And so we hope that that will continue. Big. Big screen uh, primary flight display, it does require new metal. Got to cut a new panel. How did you come about the current layout and uh, what were some of the decisions you had to make in placing this stuff in the panel? From the pilot's panel to the center stack to what we've got here on the right side, including this engine instrumentation system. It was taking a lot of the recommendations of the shop uh, as to how this might be laid out and then fine tuning it. Yep. For example, I kept my EX500 display, which is all the way over on the right-hand side of the panel, really for the principal reason that I have ship's radar that was monochrome, and when we put in the Avidyne EX500, again, a dozen or more years ago, actually I think it was more than a dozen years ago, it turned it into color, and it's very, very helpful when flying approaches fairly close into weather where uh, even XM weather or ADS-B NEXRAD is too coarse and the time lag is too high to do that safely. And so I like the ship's radar and we wanted to keep that. And so the question was, where do we put that? in the panel. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, is it okay to put the transponder all the way over on the right hand side? And it was in a discussion with the shop where I was able to say, yes, that's fine. A, because the transponder usage is minimal in flight. And B, I have control over my GTX 345 through my GTN 750XI and I can do it through the center panel as well. And so all that works very nicely. And you've got a backup flight instrument down there, that's the GI-275? That's a 275, and I opted for that rather than the G5, because I wanted the newer equipment. And uh, the display is really incredibly bright, uh, and that's the type of thing that I would want if I needed to go to a reversionary instrument. Yeah. But there, there are a lot of choices to be made along this process, and, you know, I was able 
to work with the shop in terms of keeping my WX950 storm scope. Uh, in terms of, I decided to keep my KX155 Navcom with Glide Slope as my number two instrument, uh, rather than going with a number two GPS. I like having the redundancy of being able to use a different instrument that's not a GPS instrument for uh, terrestrial-based nav aids. Um, what are your thoughts on Garmin's Smart Glide uh, technology? Smart Guide, it, it works. I mean, I've, try, I've tried it, uh, in, uh, not in the heat of battle, but in, in training. Uh, you have to get a little bit used to it. Sometimes the closest airport is behind you. And if you hit that button when you're at cruise airspeed, it will pitch you up vigorously in order to capture the best glide airspeed while it's in the turn 180 degrees to take you back toward the airport that it has identified as the spot where it needs to deliver you. Uh, so Smart Glide is good. What I find to be even more useful is on the 750XI, having it keep track of not just my glide ring around the aircraft when I'm at cruise and very often in, in locales where I am not familiar with the location of airports or the terrain or things like that but it will provide chevrons on a real-time constant basis of where you can glide given your present altitude and the glide ring of the airplane and terrain so that if you have an engine outage that's where you can head immediately and I find that that gives me a great deal of additional situational awareness which otherwise I was doing by keeping track of things uh, in, a, in, a, in a very mental way as I went along and making sure that I had some options when options were presentable and sometimes there are none and that's just the way it is and you have to come to grips with that as a, as a risk analysis when you're flying uh, IFR either in IMC or in, uh, in visual conditions. As important as picking the right equipment, it's also important to pick the right shop. You're based in the Northeast and uh, the installation was accomplished by VIP Avionics in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. Right. Uh, good shop, been around a long time, seen a lot of Garmin installations. Um, what advice might you have for choosing a shop and also working with that shop along the way? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, one is to make sure that you spend a fair bit of time talking to two or three shops that are well respected and really know how to do this work because there are a lot of shops out there and frankly what I see with uh, colleagues and contacts and all of that is they may decide to go on the cheap and their shops may not follow the uh, protocols and the checklists as thoroughly as they might in the installation and so there are problems that come out of that when it's time for shakedown and acceptance flights and all of that but first and foremost it's to talk to a number of the shops that really know how to do this and listen to them and see what they suggest in the way of equipment uh, which may be different than what you're thinking about talk with them about potential downtime, about scheduling, but I think that that's less important. If you've got a good shop, you may want to, and, and that's the shop you want to use, you know, put up with a nine month delay if you need to, in order to get their expertise. Uh, talk about potential cost, uh, warranties, and things of that nature. And also put into that mix, the, there may be a shop or two with whom you have a good working relationship of a number of years and I can't say enough about having a good relationship with shops and so that you can have a dialogue you can have an understanding they know where you're coming from you know where they're coming from and you can work together on it and that has to be factored into the mix as well it's not just a question of picking the lowest price although you might do that among the two or three really good shops that you're talking to. How long was the airplane down for this major retrofit? Yeah, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard to say how long it was down for the avionics retrofit because one of the facts of life here is that the airplane was also down at about the same time because my annual ran out. 
during that. And that took some time to get fit in by the shop. Uh, they ended up doing really fabulous work for me. They worked hard on it. They didn't dog it. It didn't sit in the corner of the shop. Uh, but there was only so much that they could do on the annual while the avionics upgrade was happening. Uh, so there were a few things that we could do that way. But in terms of the avionics upgrade itself, it's really, a, it was somewhere on the order of about 45 or so working days. That's not calendar days. That's, you know, Monday through Friday type days, uh, exclusive of holidays. And so, you know, we're, we're, we're looking close to a couple of months of, of, of work being done on the aircraft for the avionics side. And, uh, you know, it was also a process where it just takes time to do all that. And it's a little bit scary to see everything pulled out of the panel. Uh, I'd had experience with that in the past, and I knew what that was like. And I was fortunate that my prior shop, before I started working with VIP uh, a while ago now, uh, did a lot of cleanup for me behind the panel. And so all of that old wiring was gone and that helped them in the installation process here but you have to factor that in so you know something that people talk about sometimes is you know does a new avionics installation make it seem like you're flying a whole new airplane and in one respect yeah it does in a way and in another respect that's kind of silly it's still the same airplane that i've been flying since 1997 but in one respect it's really very very true and that's with the electronic engine instrumentation system. I'm able to set things so much more precisely than I ever could before with analog gauges. I know the engine is happier because I see it in the temperatures and I see it in how I don't have to fuss with things. There's less hysteresis in the instruments and it just works a whole lot better. So in that respect, I'm very pleased with the EIS, more so than I ever thought I would be. But thinking back on the project, if you knew then what you know now, would you have done anything differently? Yeah, I might have. Um, number one, the GI-275 uh, uh, backup instrument that I have is fairly low in the panel. It's underneath the G500 TXI PFD, and I probably would have put that a little bit higher. Uh, I might have thought about the yaw damper which typically, you know, at cruise, a Cessna 182, a 172, a 210, a 206, it doesn't really matter. You don't need a yaw damper at cruise, that's for sure. Not anything like what you might need in a Bonanza. I've been using the rudder forever, so it's not that much of a problem for me. And luckily in the 210, there is rudder trim. And so for a prolonged climb out, I can just set that and, and pretty much forget it. I set aside a week where I would drive up to Hartford uh, and, and do some acceptance flying, put some time on the cylinder and all of that, uh, and then I'd go home. It was complicated a little bit because we had so much smoke from the Canadian fires. It was difficult to do a lot of this oh, I remember that. Yeah. Uh, VFR, but yeah. we were able to get it done. And so I spent a day or two putting time on the cylinder, uh, making sure that that was set outside of one fuel flow issue where we had to adjust down the high pressure fuel flow in the engine, which was sort of a combination of annual and engine instrumentation system, the system worked perfectly. And again, this is a testament, I think, to the shop having followed all of the Garmin protocols to the T. Uh, and you can look for more panel planning advice in an upcoming issue of Aviation Consumer Magazine. Thank you, Larry.